baby mm -hmm. or um, you know thinking about ways to make sure that um, as Charlene said we want to have something for you know all the generations to engage with the museum and really enjoy learning about black history and understanding how it is part of our lives um, so I was in Miami and I saw the exhibition that uh, Joanne brought to, brought, made come to fruition, right? So this is all really possible because of Joanne, um, having that same eye, seeing something special and understanding that it needs to be out in the world. So um, from all the work that was there, it was a combination of visual art and this amazing collection that Kay owns, okay? And then later, we brought in Dr. Jonas to share a couple of pieces that you've seen over there. You've all had a chance to look through the space. Um, so what I'd like to do is just talk briefly, as, as briefly as possible, so that we can get, we can get their stories, right? So, shall I start? I <laughs> <laughs> Well, I spoke with many of you um, in the other building at the exhibition, so I think all of you had a chance to see it. Um, for those of you who I didn't speak to specifically, I started my journey in Africa, the Peace Corps Volunteer Sierra Leone, shortly before the whole region really imploded because of Charles Taylor's attack. In Liberia, the overthrow of the Joe government, and the spreading of that civil war, funded largely by Muammar Gaddafi, uh, throughout Sierra Leone and even into parts of Guinea. So it was a it was a difficult time. But it even in those difficult times, you were able to understand the nature of the people that were there and their incredible patience and resilience. And uh, it was the dawning of my appreciation of African art. Uh, which in Sierra Leone consisted primarily of sculpture and also basketry. Um, for those of you who are aware, there are descendants of Sierra Leonean slaves that are referred to as the Gullah, and they lived mostly in the lowlands of South Carolina. They were specifically uh, enslaved and brought over to work the rice plantations because Rice is the staple food of Sierra Leone. A Sierra Leonean will tell you that he has not eaten for the day if he has not had his plate of rice. He may have had oranges and bananas and peanuts and snacks of any kind, uh, but he will tell you that he has not had any food at all until he's had his big plate of rice and box. It could be uh, okra or uh, cassava or whatever, but he's got to that's that's really the staple of their diet. So the Sierra Leonean slaves were particularly appealing to the plantations in South Carolina that were huge producers of rice. And to this day, there are the sweet grass baskets, the baskets made by the Gullahs, which are highly prized. But in my opinion, not as good as the ones they made, they made in Sierra Leone. So that was the beginning of my journey. Um, and then I returned from my Peace Corps service and applied and finally joined the U.S. Foreign Service as a diplomat. And I was stationed in East Africa, which is a whole different dynamic. Um, Africa is a vast continent. And one of the things that most people don't understand is that on the standard map that you see, Africa is in fact much, much larger a landmass than it is portrayed. Mm -hmm. If you were actually to see how big Africa was in terms of all, it would it would throw everybody's sense of balance off kilter because we're so used to seeing everything kind of sort of the same size, you know, everybody's got their parameters. It's a huge continent. Um, you could fit China, the United States, and a few other major countries in it with no room to spare. Um, but it also has vastly different cultures. There are some countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo have 250 separate languages. And so the artwork uh, is a reflection of the culture of the people. Some do a lot of sculpture, some do a lot of painting, some, most of the objects that 
that we're considering African art for purposes of this discussion are actually functional. So even whether it's a mask, it has a purpose. Or a funerary totem from Madagascar. It has a purpose, even though the way it is carved and the way it is presented to me and to, to most Westerners, it's really a, an art, a piece of art. But in Africa, its fundamental purpose is, the, is what it's made to do, what it's designed to do. But again, most craftsmen in Africa take the time, whether it's a Jogandor in Mali, or a funerary totem, or a stool in Ghana, they really take the time to make it aesthetically pleasing, not just functional. Thank you. So that was kind of my journey. And as I went from, from Ethiopia, to Guinea, to Togo, and then went to the Bahamas, <coughs> back to Ethiopia, went to London, um, then went to Washington, then went back to East Africa, to Kenya, and then finally to Nigeria. It was really a journey of discovering what Africa meant in terms of art and function and beauty. Uh, I think that there is a misconception that there's just kind of one sort of African art, but it is vastly different depending on where you are and whether it's modern. There is a huge, huge uh, African art culture throughout the continent. Nairobi is exciting and diverse as is South Africa, whether it's Cape Town or Johannesburg, uh, Nigeria, Lagos especially, is full of extremely creative young Africans who are who exhibit worldwide, but people come from all over the place, like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, amazing art, even in its darkest hours where uh, when Mobutu was still in power, when people didn't have enough food to eat, they're still creating this amazing art. Sculpture, textiles, bronze, mosaics, it's phenomenal, the energy and the diversity of what you see come from the continent. And again, a lot of it is a reflection, not just of their history, but of how they see their future. And so, why is art so important? To you know, I think that, that art, kind of like religion in Africa, you know, there are no atheists in Africa. Mm. At least not I ever met. I think it is a sense of hope. It is a sense of optimism. It gives them a sense of what the future can be because there are obviously some extraordinary challenges that Africa faces in terms of food insecurity, in terms of political uh, malfeasance or lack of good governance throughout the continent. Um, there are still coups and counter coups or military incursions. <coughs> the there are countries that are tremendously rich in natural resources, which are so poorly managed, like the Central African Republic. That they are at the bottom rungs. There are places in Africa that have a worse maternal mortality rate than Afghanistan did during the war. It's, it's unconscionable, it's unbelievable, but it doesn't mean that it's robbed its people totally of, of optimism of the future. And I think art is one of the ways that they express their hope for the future, and I think it's just tremendously creative. I think it's, I think it's rooted in their past, and I think it's how they they see their future. I think it is simply part of African culture. And again, different groups, different countries, different regions, different tribes, all have different ways of expressing it. But it seems to be more or less a universal, a universal tenet that no matter how simple an item is, whether it's a porridge spoon from southwestern Ethiopia, which is one of the most remote places on earth, that this is somebody who's taken time to make this thing not just functional, but beautiful. And again, in places like Lagos, there are 22 million people live in Lagos. There's just a lot of energy. And, um, you know, I've met people that are very, very wealthy that live in Lagos, and they won't live anywhere else unless it's Lagos. The traffic is horrific. The garbage is everywhere. It smells like a fish market, and not a good one. 
But, you know, again, there's an energy and a dynamism that they just, this is home and this is where they, they love to be. I will tell you, I also did counseling work for part of my career, right? Issuing visas and things like that. And I will tell you this, it doesn't matter how poor a country is or what problems they're having, ultimately, everybody wants to come home. You know, that's when I laugh because, I, as I mentioned, I, I was stationed in the Bahamas, and I'm there for four years. And I will tell you, it's interesting to me that so many Bahamians sort of founded this part of Florida, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you go to the Bahamas now, like none of my none of my foreign service nationals, none of my Bahamian employees at the embassy there ever wanted to move to America. They would go to America for college, and you'll write home. And I'm like, why? And they're like, oh. All right, we're just staying there. For one, they wouldn't go swimming in America. Why? Because they couldn't see their toes in the water. I mean, you go to the Bahamas, it is some of the most beautiful water in the world. Like, you can see straight down. It's like a swimming pool. I'm like, okay, I got you. You got me down. Um, and conversely, there are um, a lot of people who left America during the American Revolution when it became clear that their side wasn't going to win. So the loyalists went and, and decamped to certain islands in the Bahamas, and they're still there. The descendants never left, they never came back, they're like still there. It's a little West Virginia, if you know what I mean. It's a little incestuous. But I'm just saying, they're still there. You can't get Bahamians here anymore. They're like, yeah, we're gonna stay where we are. But interesting that they had such an influence here initially, came and stayed. So it kind of goes with that whole, and this is sort of, you know, this is what Africa has. Africa is full of not just black Africans, but there are all kinds of groups that throughout the centuries have come. For instance, in West Africa, the Lebanese. I met many Lebanese people when I went to Sierra Leone. Some who were intermarried with Africans, so it's a whole big diverse group. But some who were still sort of pure Lebanese, but never been to Lebanon. I mean, they were Sierra Leonean as far as they could, you know, discern that I mean, that's where they were from. Um, you know, for a hundred years. The Indian culture, the same thing in East Africa. You go to Nairobi, you hear great Indian food. And again, some intermarriage, some not, but still that's where they are, and that's part of their culture. The whole Swahili culture. Some of you saw the big table in the other room, the one that's made from the Dao wood. Okay, so the Dao's were these ships from India that traded back and forth, carried back and forth for probably three or four hundred years. So there is that influence, that Swahili influence, the Lamu Island, which is a very special island not too far from the Somali border. But it has its own very distinct style. So again, it is a mix of African and Indian and whatever else is tossed in there. Madagascar as an island, right? There are species in the world found nowhere like that. And I mean hundreds of them. So when it broke off from Africa, it was like you either missed the boat or you didn't. Some people got on the boat, and then you had an influence of Indian culture, Chinese culture, African, and you know, and there it is. Some of those other islands out there in the middle of the Indian Ocean, like Mauritius, same idea. So I think that also contributes to the arts, because you have people who've gotten more than one perspective. Um, but. I mean, to me, it's all interesting and fascinating, even when the pieces I have, some I like more than others, of course. I was mentioning that the Baga in uh, coastal West Africa, from Guinea-Bissau down to Sierra Leone, are a hugely important group in terms of the art. It's amazing, and it's prized the world over, <coughs> particularly in Europe. But yet, in the more than in the seven years I lived in West Africa, 10 years. Um, I never met somebody who identified as being from the Baga tribe. So it can be interesting because people can kind of operate in one, uh, in one area of life and then just not be part of the society for other things, whether it be business or commerce or you know interacting with the US government at any level. So could I ask about the Baga art? Sure. So you've never met anybody who is Baga people? That identified as Baga. No one ever said, I'm part of the Baga tribe. And so what happened there? I don't know. <laughs> um, 
And in Guinea, there are the Pool, which is part of the Pula people. Huge, I mean, there's like five last names in all of Guinea. We got Ba, Bari, Kamara, Fonte, and Jalo, which is spelled D-I-A, but is pronounced Jalo. If anybody says Diallo to you, you can correct it. So there's that very famous case in New York where that poor Guinean immigrant was shot, what, 42 times? It was insane. I was actually in Guinea when that happened, when they brought the body back, Reverend Sharpton came and all that. But every time he says Diablo, I just get pissed and I told him right away. Like that whole family back in Guinea is going, why can't we get it right? Anyway, so there's literally like five last names, and, there, and there's some ethnic groups that are so overwhelming. I suspect that people like the Baga are such a small group of people um, in terms of total numbers. Mm -hmm. They're just probably assumed or overwhelmed by because the, the Pula or the Pool are the business class. They're the ones that you're going to interact. They own all the restaurants. They own all the, the businesses that you see on the side. I mean, they're the ones trading. They're the ones traveling throughout the region or to China to sell shoes or whatever. So are uh, other groups now imitating the bag of art? I don't think so. Okay. I don't, I, that's not something I've seen in Africa. So all the bag of art is going to be very old then? So there's no current bag of I art? I don't know. I don't, I mean, there are, I'm sure there is, but it gets harder. It gets harder because when it becomes commercialized, then they just want to churn something out. Okay. It may yeah. not be new, may not be authentic, may not be used, may not be from a village that had it as a, as a cultural piece. And so, because, sorry to keep on asking questions, but it's about the baga. So because of the, um, I guess, the thinning out of the art and being really good baga art, is that why you collected it? Well, you know, I just appealed. Okay. And after my house fire, mm -hmm. uh, my art guys really did their very best to get me some good pieces to replace some of what I'd lost. Mm -hmm. And so, it was important to them, and I really appreciated it. And so, um, I only have about half of my bag of art here. Maybe that's what I have. So you got it from other collectors? I got no. I got it from art artists. from art guys who went out into the villages, places that I gotcha. wouldn't have okay. been able to go. And again, showing up as a foreigner, they wouldn't have wanted to right. to deal with me. I told you about my story right in Ethiopia. I studied yes. a little bit of Amharic, and so I went to the ancient city of Lamandala, where they have these stone churches that are carved into the ground. When we talk about a single piece of wood, this is a single stone structure yeah. carved into the ground. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Anyway, so I had studied some Amharic before I went to Ethiopia, and so afterwards I was looking to buy, and the Ethiopians have, the Ethiopians are an ancient Christian culture. It is really the intersection of Judaism and Christianity because they were introduced to it um, in the second century by the Syrian missionaries. So I mean, this is where, and then after Christianity was introduced there, Ethiopia was sealed off for a thousand years. So there were no upgrades. And that was Christianity 1.0. And you have the drums and the incense and they start at the crack of dawn and, and they have the, uh, the Tamut, which is the uh, representation of the Ark of the Covenant. So it really is that intersection. It is Christianity like when Christ was walking around. Um, and they will tell you also that they have the Ark of the Covenant. Another story. <laughs> but, so I'm, I'm, so I'm negotiating for this cross. They, they, have, they make crosses, they're very distinct. They have several different styles of Ethiopian hand crosses and things. So I wanted to buy this one. And I asked in my heart how much it was. They told me a price and I said, whew, wouldn't have. Like, that's too much. That's expensive. And I said, and that's a Ferengi price. Ferengi meaning it's a foreigner price. And he looks at me and he's like, and? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I'm half cast. And he's like, oh, okay, and he dropped the price by 80%. Wow. <laughs> because I could tell him in Amharic that, you know, no, no, that, you know, this is from here, kind of. I mean, you probably didn't get a lot of white girls who showed up and tried to, you know, <laughs> come of there. It's the middle of nowhere, literally. But, you know, he appreciated the effort. So. I 
there are some places, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, which had a very heavy French colonial presence. The French were in Cote d'Ivoire for a long, long time. And some of that art there reflects the presence of colonials. There are things they call actually colognes, which are representations of either Africans working for colonial powers as soldiers or nurses or businessmen. Um, and then there are actually representations of the colonials themselves. So in some places, yes, they, they, they did a lot to try and integrate it. In other places, there doesn't seem to be much mention. For instance, the Baga art, as far as I can tell, reflects none of that. There's no uh, reflection of really colonial influence at all. But again, they may be a much more isolated group. What about yeah. resistance art? You know, you know, that's probably a more modern, and that's probably reflected more in painting. You would probably have to look at, I would say, Kenyan artists, because the Kenyans, of course, mounted a very strong um, uh, uh, or whatever, to, the, to the British to find it, because, you know, Kenya's beautiful. Like, you understand why the British didn't want to give them up. They were like Sierra Leone, fine, fine. But places like Kenya, they were like, wow. So I think a lot of that was probably music, Painting, um, literature. You know, I was a, when I was a teacher in the Peace Corps, and I was in Sierra Leone. I did a, I tried to introduce some poetry that talked about the um, the bad aspects of colonialism. Like this is what had happened, and the kids didn't even get it. They had been so sort of brainwashed into this rote um, curriculum that was fed to them. Like they just couldn't understand the idea of like white people being bad. I'm like, hmm. I'm like, okay, don't go to New York City, and there are a few other places you should probably avoid. Um, uh, New York yeah. and houses. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I mean, this, was, this was they couldn't they couldn't wrap their head around it. So I think you're probably looking at larger urban areas where again you had, I think you know, in the vein of Mandela, you had political protests. You had writing, you had music, and you had, I'm sure, painting more more than say traditional African sculpture because that has, as I said, that has a function, whether it's for a ceremony to promote a good harvest um, or to keep the wild animals from destroying the crops, things like that, and that would have been very rural. Most colonial influence did not extend to the same extent in the rural areas. It was much more focused on the coast and in the cities. And so I think the reaction to that would have been, again, focused in those areas among urban populations and probably non-traditional art as opposed to traditional sculpture. Yeah, and for this exhibition, I didn't interrupt you. Did I? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. So for this exhibition, it was it, it's totally different from the exhibit that I saw that Joanne first, you know, curated. So we wanted to make sure. Yeah, but like, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, a really strong theme and the, around thresholds, right? So. We didn't want art in this. Well, I mean, it is art. Painting. We, we didn't want. We didn't want decorative objects. We wanted to make sure we stuck to works of art that were utilitarian, that did have some type of purpose and some transitional stage. So um, that's why we have the snakes, and then we have the funerary totems. Um, so it's all the work in this exhibition is all about you know the cultural aspects of what it's like to as you were speaking about earlier you know have this sense of hope so hope is is happens in stages right mm -hmm. so you know we've got from birth to you know adolescence marriage childbearing child rearing um, transition to another plane. So all of the objects in there would have been used for you know, those types of celebrations of transition. And she has, her collection is 
<laughs> much more extensive than what you're seeing here today. Um, and we actually had to weed through some things to make sure that we didn't overwhelm the Spade Museum. You know, um, and make sure we selected objects with great care and consideration. Um, and then Joanne and I had to, you know, kind of figure out how to put it all together in the space and make sure that. You know, a good job. By the way. Yeah, to me, it's a great, great, really great job. You did an excellent job. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. We had to put together all these labels and everything. And so I learned a lot. Okay, good. So I learned a, a lot, you know, working on this project. I had to do a little bit of research. And of course, Kay was there to share. And Dr. Jones, would you like to join us at the table? Okay. It would be a pleasure. Okay. Circuitous for the was born in Guyana. Yay. We see Bush Guyana. <laughs> and um, from an early age, I was curious to know how people like me got to Guyana. So the, um, the slave trade and the, this the, um, movement of people from Africa to the Western world as chapel um, got my interest. And so as I moved through high school and came over here for graduate education, I got interested in Africa as there was a development and a resurgence of um, people trying to get out from under the colonial yoke. And <clears throat> my exposure at Howard, I learned more outside the classroom than I did in the classroom. But you got students from East Africa, West Africa, Francophile Africa, Anglophile Africa, all over the place. All striving to become independent. And uh, President Obama's father, interestingly enough, he was a little bit older than my generation, but I had a good chance to meet a very good friend of his, Tom Aboya. Now, Tom Aboya ultimately went back to Kenya and was assassinated, unfortunately. But he was a backbencher in the cruise uh, in um, Kenya's arena. <clears throat> in any event, my interests rubbed off, especially when another student at Howard, who came from Florida, I'd say, uh, came up to me one day and said, You talk in funny. I said, Yeah, I'm from the West. Said, he said, No, you get you, you get you. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> <then. laughs> I said, Gigi, what's Gigi? And he never bothered to explain. But to make, to make a long story short, that really piqued my interest. You know, people living off the savannah get rice as much as the West Indians did, love rice. Low, the lowland people <clears throat> didn't get malaria too much because many of them were sickle cell positive and the Navajo's mosquito didn't. <laughs> the cells got stuck in there. To be a long story short. But in any event, there was a lot of um, ethnic communion, so to speak, with the Sea Island people and people from the Bahamas and from Haiti and from the rest of it. So all that came together in my, in my mind's eye and said, you know, the culture of Africa had a lot to do with the culture of the United States. And so as, <clears throat> as I became more interested in this topic, I started following the evolution of people trying to become independent, their strive, big strike for independence. The Mau Mau Revolution in Kenya, which to hear the British say that it was just a, a group of people trying to overthrow the, the government, nonsense. The Mau Mau Rebellion was nothing less perhaps a lot more than you saw in other countries, mm -hmm. except that they had the common sense to realize that unless they gave us the right to become an independent government, we could fight them to the end. And so we had the British fighting this revolutionary people, largely made up of Kikuyus, but the Luos that President Obama descended from were also part of the struggle with the other small tribe. So to, 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 bring, to bring us to why I'm here tonight, um, Joe and another guy in his uh, saw some paintings I had at home that myself and my wife collected during our travels to West Africa, East Africa, and North Africa. We've been all over. 
um, I gave most of my pieces to the to um, sister of museum in, in Brower, mm -hmm. but a few pieces that were left, a few pieces of being displayed next door. What fascinated me, and Kenya and Uganda particularly, is because the British loved Kenya. If you were to see the highlands of Uganda, you think it's the cliffs of Dover. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful uh, country. And so they wanted to hold on to it. And uh, Juba Kenyatta, one of my heroes, and I would suggest to both of you, if you have the chance to read his autobiography. Mm -hmm. Next door, there's a fly whisk. Mm -hmm. that he used a replica of what he used to brush flies off the river and give his speeches. I was never fortunate enough to hear him speak, but I've read both of his speeches. And I get his daughter who followed in his footsteps in the Kenyan government. I get, I didn't meet Tom O'Boy, but I get people who knew him, he was a duo. I'm mentioning the tribes because tribalism, fortunately or unfortunately, it just be the service. And that is the cause of a lot of conflict in Africa because the British had a story goes to take a, a, a napkin from the table and draw countries, as someone mentioned, a square of long, whatever they felt like. But um, so they cut across tribal boundaries. And of course, the tribes didn't know about um, territorial integrity and all that. They hunt there, they hunt there, they hunt everywhere. Mm -hmm. They were always into tribal rivalry many of which were stoked and promoted and pushed by the British. The old divide and conquer, you know? Uh, but it, let me get back to where I'm going. I'm rambling a little bit because these thoughts are just flowing as I speak. That's good. The, um, I think you asked the influence of colonial powers in African art. It is there. If you were to see some of the batik paintings from Ugandan and Kenyan artists, the form and everything, they spent as much time imaging their subjects like any Italian or Western uh, artist would do. Features are well formed, interesting but not fascinating for me. I like to see the raw, you know, what fascinated me is the guys, you go along the street and you see people whittling on a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. They say, what are you doing in the translation? And he said, oh, I'm making something. What are you making? I don't know. How oh, do you know when you're finished? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and, it's, and it's that fascination with handmade objects that really, really got my attention. You go to a place like the home near Togo or some parts of that, their metal work is fashioned. You can see it's done by a machine. I didn't like that too much. I wanted to see the, the raw native mahogany or ebony pieces that people took their, their time to whittle them. So it's a, 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 what I'm saying is, my interest is more a question of expression of, 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 of blackness, so to speak, in art, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how it came up against what we in the West like to pride ourselves as Western art and Western literature, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Questions. Just following out what he said about tribalism. So part of the other very destructive aspect of colonialism was the um, promotion of certain tribes over others. Mm -hmm. So there would be favored tribes among the indigenous population, thereby creating a greater sense of imbalance. So the Kikuyu would be the would be the house cat. And maybe the Lua or the Maasai would be the gods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there would be this whole hierarchy of, you know, if you worked in the house, you were higher yes. up than the guy who worked in the field. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and then there was a the whole thing about the limited education resources would go to a certain ethnic group, a certain tribe, thereby advantaging them more yeah. over the other groups. Which yes. certainly art would be seen more? Or no, no, I'm just saying they would have more advantages. Right. And, then when, culture, yeah. and then when colonialism finally disappeared, mm -hmm. 
then you had one group that was sort of in a better position to succeed than some of the others, which then fed the same with you. Right? <laughs> right? Which fed the tribalism. Mm -hmm. Right? It made it more destructive. <clears throat> Now. Your Amerindian oh. history is uh, not unlike what was happening in, in colonial Africa mm -hmm. or colonial Far East. Mm -hmm. Why the tribes kept one mm -hmm. fighting against the other? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Sure. And again, it wasn't just, yes, I mean, there was a very predatory uh, economic reason, but there was also, there's also a mindset which is important to keep in perspective, was that there was this real sense of we're better. Okay, the Europeans. Oh, the colonies, so yes, of course. Yeah. We're better. Yes. Therefore, we're going to embrace our religion, our culture. I mean, this wasn't, you know, it wasn't all just about money. It was about culture. Now, the French had a very interesting relationship with many of their former colonies. Some of them, like Senegal, continue to have a very strong bond with France. One of the former Senegalese presidents was made a member of the Academy Francaise. So there's some of that because they, they really felt like they were improving African culture by making them French. Um, others were much less the Brits did some of that, but not as much. The Portuguese did nothing. Like, they left and took everything with them. The one exception in the Francophonie was Guinea. saint Couture basically told Charles de Gaulle to get the heck out of Guinea and take his crap with him. <laughs> and de Gaulle responded by, yes, taking everything, like the telephone wire, I mean, the railroad tracks. I mean, just really took the country down to that's a true story. Yeah. 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 I, I had some friends from North Africa, Algeria, and so on, who said the French even took the operating room lights with them. I mean, yeah, it was that bad. It was that nasty. <laughs> yes, well, he was, you know, he was tall, right? I mean, that was kind of his stick. Um, and Saint Couture, who started out as kind of a revolutionary hero, quickly descended into crazy. I mean, killed all his political rivals made a, it was interesting, there was a very large Russian compound, even when I was there. Um, he, he got into bed with the Russians, who immediately sent them snow plows. If there's one snow thing you'll plow? never need in Guinea, it's a snow plow. I guarantee it. Um, yeah, so it was, they really took advantage. But there were a lot of Guineans when I was there who spoke Russian. They had been sent to Russia for education, and a lot of Russians who had married Guineans. So I have a particularly beautiful piece of ceramic art that was made by a Russian woman married to a Guinean. And I loved it so much. And I went to get it, and I went to the, uh, it was an art ex exhibition, and they said, okay, you can buy it whenever, you know, after the exhibit's over. And I went back, and, and it wasn't the artist, it was her salesperson, and it said, oh, oh, je suis désolé, j'ai oublié complètement. Like basically, I'm so sorry, I completely forgot that you, you know, wanted to buy this, and I sold it to somebody else. Yeah. I'm like, okay, whatever. Maybe I'll get another one made. So I met the artist and I said, could you make me another one? And she said, sure, no problem. And she made it, and then my house burned down. And the person who <laughs> bought the person who bought the original <laughs> one, no, the person who bought the original one gave it to me as a gift. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. So I actually ended up with the original piece that I actually wanted, and thank God I didn't buy it, right? Because it would have burned up. So, um, so there was this huge Russian influence, even you know, through the late, and they came and they built all these uh, between them and the Chinese. They came and built all these big stadiums and monumental buildings. It's kind of crazy in a place like Guinea, but you had all this stuff. Of course, the advantage of having a Chinese there was like they all stayed. So there were like great Chinese restaurants in Connecticut. <laughs> so if you didn't want French, you could have Chinese. <laughs> I didn't ever see a Russian restaurant. They probably just didn't do the food thing, you know, couldn't get enough beets or something. But so there were all these very harmful things. And, and when you when you opened it, we talked about history and real history, because unreal history is not history. 
and what was proposed earlier this year, it just it makes me nauseous. It makes me sick to my stomach. I'm a history major. Mm -hmm. And American history is good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. And you have to own all of it. Right. Because right. if you don't, then none of it's real. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And as somebody who observed the damage of 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade on both sides, I find it incredibly appalling. And you know, I have a daughter. I mean, I'm gonna have to watch what they're teaching her. Well, of course, the, the good news is they're not teaching her any history at all right now, of any kind. Um, but that what they teach her is an actual fact, because it is so dangerous. I mean, you know, this is part of what happened in Africa for all these years. People with those fairy tales about what was really going on. And we certainly can't do that here. Because people will then believe that this not real history is actually history. And anything that isn't real is not history, it's a fairy tale. you look at and it, it emotes you, it, it does something to you, you respond to it. Now, if I were a white millionaire and I want to have some pieces of Italian art from, you know, from Florence or wherever, I make sure I pay an artist a large amount of money to mimic what I consider great art. How many people would go down Boga Boy Road, for instance, in Tanzania and see somebody whittling on a route pay him money to, to lift him up. Mm -hmm. In other words, the value of black art would only come about when those of us who have a semblance of appreciation are willing to put out and pay out to get it. Mm -hmm. We start with supporting the Spady Museum. Mm -hmm. how, many, how, many, how many places like Spady Museum can you go and learn a little bit about black art mm -hmm. or a group like us? And that's where it all starts. Mm -hmm. There are artists now in, in Savannah area, Charleston, that are half selling Geechee art, mm -hmm. which is something that I haven't gone much into, but it's fascinating. Because the Geechee art is like American slash black art. Mm -hmm. And it brings out something in you, like one of the artists there painted his mother going across the river to give birth to him, and she's pregnant. And then you, you hear this guy describe, and he said, why is that pregnant lady in that picture? Mm -hmm. And he said, that's because that's my mother going across the river to the hospital to give birth to me. Now, how can you forget a painting like that? Mm -hmm. How much can you pay for it? Mm -hmm. So in other words, I don't know how you would inculcate or sort of stimulate interest mm -hmm. in black art unless you start with the appreciation of what you see around us here. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you know, how do we get a community to begin to appreciate, you know, art? Because one of the uh, issues that, you know, well, uh, I've dealt with it's it somehow even when we try to bring art into a community, because of gentrification, people get to see it as something that will elevate, right? Yeah, that will be basically um, you, you know, even their properties, everything else, okay, they won't be able to live within that community because of what art does. Because once you begin to have, let's say, something like a museum or anything else, you begin to see that with different demographic, right, moving in. And certainly now, for those who are renting, yeah. you know, they're being pushed, pushed out. So how do we now put their mind at ease and, and provide them with that sense of security that, you know, art is not what is? It's something that basically, you know, we can we all can enjoy without you know having to you know to be fearful. Of. Well, partly that's a learned experience too, and the exposure that kids get at a, at a formative age when they begin to appreciate the things around them, mm -hmm. they could look at a Michelangelo and see a David. You know, the time it takes to fashion a picture anatomically correct, etc., mm -hmm. and you could look at something. Like uh, you see around here, and you see well, why is that profile of a black in the middle passage? Why is that interesting? And, and, and there are several black artists around the country because I, I bought from several of them. How do you get the average brother 
to appreciate black art? And that's a question I can't answer. I'm not equipped to answer. I, I enjoy it because I happen to Maybe we can that begin. persuasion. But, but, but gradually in the schools, as the exposure becomes more expansive, I think more and more of not my generation, but second, third generation after me will begin to appreciate it. Spady Museum, for instance, who is willing to sponsor the museum mm. and put some serious money into it so that a few years from now you have a beautiful structure like the ones we have in West Palm and so on? Yeah. Well, in our, in our appreciation and our collection is really a very small segment of the society, period. Yeah. For, for black Americans to have a greater appreciation of African art, may require some discovery of Africa itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it came to me, right? Mm -hmm. I was there. I'd always been fascinated by Africa. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to Africa, and I went to Africa, mm -hmm. and I kept going back to Africa. And, and that, that informed my appreciation of what I saw around me. So, like anything else, part of it is the familiarity, and to understand what it means, where it comes from, but there are very few people, relatives in society, who really appreciate art at all, past mm -hmm. a very basic level. And that's white, black, brown, any color. Especially in this country. Especially in this country. You know, you go to Europe, it's, it's a part of everyday life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look at what's happened here. We talked about education. What are the first things they get rid of? Art and music. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't matter. Like, yeah. Yeah. And they, and they also, I'm sorry to interrupt, but sure, no. Europeans, I mean, I, I know people who live there, and they they support artists. There's yeah. You don't have to apply for a grant and do all this <laughs> stuff. There's, um, it's and built into courage. their, yeah, it's built into the society, you know. They, they get a stipend for making art. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how, is the, how is the elementary school kid find out about Spady Museum in this environment? We do have to. Uh, we we have to be very careful to, and we have the power to. We have to be very careful to redefine art. Uh, art is so many things that we don't think it is. Mm -hmm. Art is. I remember at a uh, ebony hair pick mm -hmm. back in the sixties when. I had a bush out to here, <laughs> and I pick it up, you know. I couldn't comb my hair in the way, but this African hair pick was a great piece of art, and I think it's still in my house now. But uh, that's that we didn't look at it then as art. Uh, we have the greatest music on earth. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Uh, the colonial systems gave way to the neo-colonial, as Professor uh, uh, okay. Rodney from, oh. <laughs> from, from Ghana, Walter Rodney, Walter yes, Rodney, Walter Rodney. Rodney. talked yes. about neo-colonialism. How England underdeveloped Africa. Africa. Yes. Africa. Yes. Africa. And part of that is in the art. Now, we have to look at this new colonial system that's been set up. We have to look at it very carefully and see what, how that is destroying us, keeping us from from becoming who, who we are. And so it's a big challenge of definition. Once we can redefine who we are, we're going to be road, in, on the road someplace. Mm -hmm. Africa will rise up with us. But we have to be in the process of redefining it. And uh, it's happening a lot in Africa because you'll find a rejection of the, uh, of the uh, French and Niger, for example, uh, throughout. In throughout Africa, uh, we're seeing a rejection of colonial, colonial, old colonial powers who have been manipulated. 
with their neocolonial agendas. So now, going back to Or, uh, is it, because you, know, you talk about the recurring state in Africa, you know, in the internal powers, and I'm trying to figure out, trying to find out how an artist, they are, are, we, they are basically reacting to that, because they are this state of sort of repressive state, you know, they cannot really uh, uh, do what they would want to express themselves. So how do they find in a way that to, well, I, I think to bring that about? I think that's what you see. I think, you know, look, Kenya is stunning with beautiful country. Kenyatta's son was also president. He's he wanted, daughter, then he's right, but there's a huge amount of corruption that's gone along with all of that. The current president, Ruto, I mean, that's it. Again, it you is know, un Excuse me, there were some Kenyans who themselves was against uh, um, Mze, uh, Joe Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. There's a guy who left, went to law school in England, went back to Kenya, and began to dress like in the native Mawa clothes, with spear and feather, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the address they have. How many colonial leaders were wanting to do that? He was exposed to the very best mm -hmm. in English education, but just felt it necessary for the development of his own country to head mm -hmm. a group that, that was labeled, that was in high school, labeled terrorists. Right. And the Mawau now, England is denying the history when somebody, the oldest Mawau guy is about to die, he's about 100 years old, hasn't had any reparation. So for those of us who expect reparation from slavery, good luck to you. The <laughs> Mawau has never got any. Well, but but when you talk about when you talk about art, so there is a there happens to be a Kenyan artist that I collect. His name is Anthony Okello. Yeah. Okay. He does fantastic stuff, but he does it in a way. I mean, everybody knows. But for instance, there was a whole series he did using like a circus. So he had the had the ring, you know, the ringmaster and the tears were the calendars of the Kenyan flag. It's all done very cartoonish, but it's a very clear message. You know, and juggling the nation, the balls that the, that the jester is juggling are the colors of the Kenyan flag. So there, as I said, there is a lot of dynamism in Africa and a lot of the way that people are expressing their displeasure at their own governments, their black African governments. I mean, you know, look at, look at what South Africa is after you had Mandela. And you end up with Zuma. <laughs> okay, kind of basically the South African version of Trump. Yes. Um, you, you know, you. So there is a lot. There was so much promise in the late 50s and early 60s for that wave of independence. Hmm? Yeah. And unfortunately, most of it has not been realized in the way it should be. Mm -hmm. um, but you still have a lot of Africans that are very committed to trying to change their countries. And again, artists who express themselves. Music, right? A lot of music comes out of Africa. A lot of music talks about what needs to be done, what needs to change in Africa to make Africa better for Africans. Um, colonialism was a horrible, horrible crime against humanity. But at a certain point, you have to start taking some responsibility because you can't continue to look back you have to look forward so that you can create this brighter future. And again, I think that's a part of what Africans do with art and music in particular. Mm -hmm. um, because that is their, their hopeful sign for the future. And you know, there are a lot of problems in our country, in Africa. But I will tell you this, I have the privilege of serving at the embassy in Nairobi when President Obama made his trip. And I will tell you that as an American, and as a long time resident of Africa, I could not have been prouder. I mean, when we talk about the American dream, the young man left his village in Western Kenya, came to America, American woman, had a child, finished his education, had some issues personally, turned to his country, unfortunately killed. But on that day, I was there and watched his son return as the president of the United States. 
extinct. Yeah. The Kenyan people were beyond. And when I think about the promise of my country, that's what I hope for. Mm -hmm. My country is still possible of producing that. I agree, but it, it's just that, you know, when we get to that point, you know, we, we forget there's that undercurrent of course. that is constantly, you know, moving, you know, we become comfortable, you no. know, because, you know, we think of, you know, actually arrived, and yet this is how we get pulled well, out. Well, no, and, and part of what happened, right, because the ascension of Obama as president, right. disrupting that long line of white guys, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yet stirred up all this hate that we see yeah. now. Yeah. And gave rise to some of this, but we can't let it win. We can't just say, oh, well, well, we're screwed. No, we have to remember that we are still a country that elected Barack Obama president. And I was in Ethiopia for his inauguration, and I watched it, you know, at a big hotel on the screen, and was surrounded by Ethiopians and other international uh, diplomats and things. And everybody was just so happy so filled with optimism and hope. And yes, yeah, there's a lot that's happened in the last five years to really dim that. But we can't forget that we as a nation and as a people are still possible. Of, well, when you, you talk know. about um, the ascension of Obama, the only reason that happened is because we, black people, made that happen, right? So um, it's kind of like what happens when with the creation of these artworks and the that are in the museum. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the, so so absolutely we have to move forward, but we absolutely cannot forget our past. So when you talk about, you know, that hopeful thing and you're like, well, I don't know though. The only thing, the only way that we move forward is by our own hands. And that's the same thing that's happening in this exhibition. We see that every transition that happens for us as people, it's gotta be done from the in the house. We have to, we have to make these changes. We have to make sure our children know. We have to make sure our children are engaged. We have to make sure the elders tell us what has happened because that oral history is crucial to blackness, right? So we have to make sure we're collecting that information and passing it on and being really present with ourselves. So that's a good, I like that you said, you know, having that connection to Africa. If we don't have it, we have no desire to collect African art, right? So we also need to make sure we're connecting here with ourselves, right? So, um, you know, we, we've been connecting right now in this room, right? <laughs> okay. If we want change, I think we have to empower artists. Artists are the most sensitive and the best communicators in our society, in every society. You're going to find the artists. Now, there are two kinds of artists. You've got the artists who maintain the status quo. And they're the ones that are going to be getting the grants from the big corporations. But there are artists out here who have the consciousness of our, of our people rising, of, of the rising of our people. Those artists need to be supported. Those artists need to have a place here in the space of Museum. And, uh, I, I, you know, I think the future that we want to see is firmly in the hand of artists if we can develop it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and part of that is supporting art mm -hmm. wherever, you know, and, and, you know, but this is making your voice heard, making your voice heard within your community, but also voting. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many people who don't bother to vote. And things like the National Endowment of the Arts, okay, it always takes a hit from very conservative you know, folks. They don't think it's important. They don't understand the value of it. It's supporting all of those kinds of things, yeah. from the top down to the bottom. Art 
is something that, again, as I will tell you, many people don't appreciate of every skin tone group. Mm -hmm. It's just the truth. There are very few people who really appreciate and, and support art and artists. You know, yeah. I mean, I collect not just African art, I like American artists of all stripes, you know, of whether they do sort of primitive American art, whether they create wooden bowls, I'm kind of a wooden bowl person. <laughs> um, you know, and, and just things, things of beauty, things that are hand-on, things that people have taken time and intention to make, and that's all part of the, the world is full of beautiful, cool stuff. And a lot of people just, it's just not something that's on their radar. And you know, so part of this is just talking about it, going to it, supporting it, and you know, supporting an artist. It could be a, it could be an artist in Del Rey. I mean, there are all kinds of art fairs and things like that throughout this area. Like starting now, even though like there's the uh, green market in uh, West Palm, and I'm sure there are other yeah. arts, and you get people there who create mm -hmm. stuff. So that's all part of the the culture. Because those folks, you know, if you don't support them, then they just they go away. They stop creating art. So yeah, have it on people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we have one more comment. We just have one more comment. I one just, question. I'm very passionate about this, so I just gotta get it out. Before I leave you. <laughs> I know what you're going to say because I was going to say. No, I was going to say um, um, passionate about art and basically passionate about um, it starts with education, it starts with healthcare, it starts with promoting. And I, when I say education, it's not just your ABCs, it's everything, it's art classes. It's, you, a person, a 13-year-old or 14, is only worried about themselves and who they're going to hook up to. All right, but a young young mind is a sponge, and if you start teaching them from the beginning how art, education, history, this is part of you. We will never get there, and it starts with a coalition of everyone who wants to progress in a positive way and snuff out the negative. And the albatross of this country, and but it, but it won't start with like adults. Adults like us are, are passionate about it, and we can only do so much. When children from the lower ages go up and start appreciating through good teaching and providing health care and everything else that goes along with it, um, that's when we'll start to see real. And we need it as a coalition because the divide would fall. The divide would fall. Yeah. We need to do it together, you know? So that's all I got. <laughs> we could start by just promoting, um, or go and attending black art shows. That's, you know, it doesn't need to be simple. Just go and, go and attend some black art shows. Art Basel's happening, there's local black shows. You can go any kind of show, but just start going. Two things I want to do. One of them, my mom ran a, an art gallery when I was growing up, and she used to have it summer camps and when my mom died i was totally i i didn't i, I didn't even remember but maybe about 50 people co commented that their introduction to art was all these little summer workshops my mom did and i never realized how many people it touched until she died that everyone was commenting about it i had completely forgotten about it you know so it it, it getting people when they're young yeah, and the, i mean you may not go to school maybe we need to put on workshops so you know, we used to have pottery and painting and writing and all forms of art. And so that, that was a big, you know, shock to me that all these people remember this. So maybe you need to think about actually promoting people in these work, that kind of thing. Well, it's just exposing kids. Yeah. I mean, she's not doing exposure. a great job tonight. Yeah. But generally, you know, I've been taking my kid to art shows since she was three months old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was a child, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago all the time. Every school field trip, all of that. It just exposes you to art. Mm -hmm. And it can be European, it can be Asian, it can be African, it doesn't matter. But it has to be something. You have to develop that sense that art is important yeah. and art is part of life. And if you make it part of life, art, music, all of that, it, it, it's something that, that sticks with you. Yeah, and that's the part. Yeah. Let's close with this statement that I'm about to make. That's the part. We have to make anything that's important to us part of our life, and we need to make sure that we're sharing that with the people in our lives. Um, so let's share. But 
let me share one more thing, okay? <laughs> so this is something that we do at the Spade Museum as well. We make sure we have workshops where youth are, we have art workshops, we have writing workshops, we yes. have book club, we're actually gonna be starting some um, supplemental history programming, okay? Real history, right? So, you know, the Spade Museum is on this job, okay? Um, but we have to remember to, like I said, make the time. We do have time to go to our openings. We do. We have time to come to this thing right here, right now. And we'll drive and find it if we commit to understanding that it's important for us to do these things. We have time to go to an opening down the street or down that street. We just have to make those choices and share these opportunities with the people in our lives.